not dead and the saved. They've been asked to wait in paediatrics. It's five o'clock already and the sun is streaming in through the high unopenable windows. There's a concert going on in the day room, thrum, 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 and his name is Aitken Drum. The sun is lying on top of the blanket and has kept his trainers on. He's lately taken to wearing aggressively small jeans which he buys in the children's department and customises with razor blades, black thread and biro drawings in the style of Aubrey Beardsley. He taps his dirty fingers on his ripped t-shirt. His large, glittering brown eyes sweep the empty ward. Look, he says in his new adolescent scratchy voice, I'm not dead. What? says the mother, sleepily. The mother has been putting off her tiredness for so long that it tends, like a neglected middle child, to leap at her at the least chance. Just now it is sitting on her lap, arms tight around her neck, breathing the scents of paediatrics into her mouth, strawberry syrup, toasted cheese, pea. And not dead, says the son, look, under the window. The mother cranes round and stands up briefly. She sees a baby sleeping in a plastic cot. It is wearing a pink woolly hat and cardigan and has oxygen tubes in its nose. See, says the son. It's a baby, says the mother crossly. Someone's baby. But the baby's eyes are too far apart and it has a cleft palate and its whole body has a flattened, spatchcock look as if it is trying to separate into two pieces, east and west, and the mother is already worrying that there might be a crisis and she will be called upon to do something. The mother is not a good choice for the parent of chronic invalid. She is scrawny and impatient and she fears sick things, fallen fledglings, wounds, things that pulse. Someone else always has to pick them up. Her ex-husband, preferably, who is bluff and easy with illness, who would carry the son as a six-year-old casually around the hospital in his arms, the tubes draped jokerly but handily over his shoulders, talents he's now wasting on a new, completely well, wife and child. She should be dead, says the son, like in nature. I mean, if that baby was born in a primitive tribe, she'd be dead in seconds. So would lots of people, says the mother. So would I. I would, says the son, definitely. He raises his fists to his forehead, surveys the puncture wounds inside his elbows and adds, I'd be the deadest. The mother feels impatient. Once the son was prodigious and original, and the mother was daffy and wacky, and they were on the same side. Now they seem doomed to partake in endless EFL oral exams, with the son taking the part of the difficult student, the one with the nose stud. You were a perfectly healthy baby, she snaps. Not really, says the son. Only, apparently. I was born with it, remember? My tumour. That's what the new guy reckons. Oncology is a new favourite subject. So is genetics and blame. The mother decides not to meet the son's eyes. Anyway, she says instead, we're not primitive. No, says the son, leaning back on his pillow. We've got the technology now. And because we have the technology, we have to save her, the baby. I mean, the doctors and people, when a baby like that is born, they have to save her. It would be wrong to ask them not to save her. I can totally see that, because then they would be like murderers. And, says the mother, so then the person they say is not dead, but sometimes they're not alive either. Like they need the technology to keep them going. Like they can't be properly alive, but no one knows what to do with them. Not dead. See? The mother wakes up. She senses danger. She leans forward and the son fixes her with his shining eyes. I see them everywhere, you know. Not just in the hospital. Some of them are in disguise, but I can spot them. Like they have a little shiny outline around them, like in a game on a screen. They pixelate, Mum. They pixelate at me. Like, there, there, there. Shouldn't really be here. You, you, you. Not really here. Me, me, me. Not dead. No, says the mother, loudly, unsurely. You're alive. I'm not dead, says the son, because of the machine. But where am I alive? In your mind, says the mother. You're alive in your mind. That's the thing. The life of the mind. Because the mother believes this, most sincerely. And so, during the long while they have to wait for the plasma and the trolley, for the machine and the nurses, the mother babbles about Robert Louis Stevenson, also sickly, also bookish. Then she enumerates to the son the titles of all the books he loves most, all the books they've read together, their favourite episodes. And after a while, the son says, you know, White Fang? I was thinking about that. 
I think it's like a prequel to Call of the Wild. White Fang is Buck's grandfather. You can work it out. There are like all these little clues. Then he curls down on the pillows and chatters on about the great dog Buck and how he's actually fulfilling White Fang's dream or maybe like the call of his genes when he runs into oblivion with Canadian woods. And daringly, the mother takes his hand and folds it inside her own and remembers how soft it was when he was a little boy. Really as soft as a petal. The curved, veined petal of a magnolia in its brief springtime brilliance. And all the while, the baby breathes in its tubing, its arms abandoned by its sides, its ribcage moving up and down with exaggerated depth in its pink covers, like a giant, disconnected heart. Um, so following that, things... You both also um, subvert the sort of straight linear form. I think somebody called your story an anti-story, didn't they? Which was surprising, I think, in some ways. Um, but it is, I think, to do with the gaps that you can leave in a short story, which, again, I don't think necessarily work as well in, in a novel. Um, but there is something about the shortness and the precision of the form, which, as you were saying, is more akin, perhaps, to a radio play, too. Do you, are you, were you conscious when you were sort of writing The Not Dead and the Saved about how much gap were able to leave? Well, it's partly the way I write, which is always very sort of, I think it's because of starting the poet, which <laughs> seems very long. And it's got these little sections. Um, and also, it is that voice from the radio producer saying, oh, just cut the boring bits, move, move the action on, no, don't. <laughs> don't leave all those things in but it's also it's also to do with you know it's the mother the mother that is trying to trace the meaning and trying to find the pattern and I wanted it to be not the redemptive <coughs> pattern when you say well his life was good because this has happened um, and he, he has a moment when he, he has a attempts to redeem his life and say that he's saved and has a child and all that but the, the, the story doesn't cover that the story just covers the um, being in the hospital when he's an adolescent the suicide attempt and the, and the death because I, I wanted to not to tell the redemptive story, not to tell the comforting story, but to tell the really awful story of just this, all this love and all this energy and all this medicine that went just into an awful lot. So I wanted, I wanted not to let myself off and not let the story off. So I suppose yeah, the, the, other, the other way, actually some of the readings of that story, people got puzzled, why wasn't the son telling the story? Or why wasn't the wife telling the story? And why isn't it an optimistic story? It's because, it's, it's because I didn't want it to be. I wanted it just to be this, about this one the really bad bit, because people do die, they do, and people do get chronic illnesses that make their lives wretched, and in fact that's a new thing that we've invented, I think it's a, and we haven't really managed to start talking about it, never mind how much reality is in the novel, there aren't many novels about actually living with somebody who's chronically, mentally or physically ill for years and years and years, because in our society we do not let people die.